yeah, should be in business now. Right. Hello, and um, of course, I have to begin by thanking you, Janan, profusely for doing this, bringing us together. I'm thrilled to be with you, Akram and Linda. It's been a while, Akram. Although I don't know what to make of you, so I brag about you about that as the other person who is a native speaker, yet you uh, speak in English faster than I do in Arabic. Um, Linda, I see you every week uh, as part of our work for the Save Washington State Historical Society. So this is our plug, I guess. Um, yeah, it was suggested to me actually to talk about advocacy because likely because of my book, which I'm happy to do anyway, for many reasons. Uh, I think it's very fitting that we're talking about advocacy in this context, uh, like an event organized by the ADC, because I look at the ADC as an extension of the last bout of early activism, namely the Institute of Arab American Affairs, which lasted from 1943 roughly, although we have to work through the dates definitively through uh, 1951 or so. So uh, a very complex set of uh, events and developments, <clears throat> I think in my mind, led, uh, you know, caused the, the uh, ADC to be the closest we've come to the Institute of Arab American Affairs, uh, which was about advocacy. So here you have it, you know, Arab American advocacy. Um, I'd like to build the context for and talk about the Arab National League, although I have very few slides about the organization. Altogether, I must have maybe seven or 800 um, manuscript pages about those organizations. I'll be very, very briefly talking about, although I'll be mentioning only two of them, uh, maybe three, um, the New Syria Party, the Arab National League, and the Institute of Arab American Affairs. Um, so Syria was always looked at as the mother country for a collection of immigrants who came from all parts of what we call uh, natural Syria or geographic Syria or Bilad al-Sham, be that uh, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria proper, and the very, very few, if any, who came from east of the Jordan River. So when I speak to elderly people, very often they tell me meekly, almost pleadingly, we used to be Syrians as if we don't know what happened. They are Syrians. We, we should remember them as such and build the context for that. And, and at some point delve into how did we become Arab Americans, which I am proposing to do here. So we have a lot of archival evidence. It's buried in people's attics and basements. I am very, very fortunate. And my life was set on a new track because I was entrusted with this you know, sizable collection. And people give me th things, although I'm not a collector. I, I should state that for the record. But I do have some important books, um, some of the early um, uh, volumes that were printed in the Arab American newspapers by the Arab American newspapers, which uh, Linda mentioned. And those folks were forced to look at Syria. Uh, you know, their eyes and their hearts turned towards Syria because what Syria was facing, namely uh, a, a movement of Turkification by the remnants of the Ottoman uh, Empire, the, uh, the Young Turks and the, the junta that came around, which suspended the constitution and embarked on a policy of Turkification. So they acted vehem vehemently to that. And they expected the uh, events of World War I. So 1913 was a peak year for immigration. The idea here is that they brought all their baggage with them. They brought a very, very clear sense of who they are. So one could actually begin with answering the, as, answering these, uh, uh, the question of who are the Arab Americans? Well, they are Arabs. They are Arabs, Arabic speakers, and the language is one of the a huge marker of their identity. Uh, but they're also Syrian and from the Lebanon area. So they're Lebanese, Syrians, no uh, contradiction in terms, uh, or from Palestine, which was known as Southern Syria for a time. And I'd like to take us to the kind of this birthing moment for many of the immigrants so Arab Americans are unique in many respects, but their American experience is actually falls in line uh, along the lines of this, you know, a time when cultural pluralism had its day in the sun, which happened around World War II. 
by that time, integration, you know, structural integration took its course. I mean, they joined PTAs, they belonged to unions, they fought in World War I, World War II, they spoke English. And very much the, this adage by, or the theory by Marcus Lee Hansen, immigration historian, that the grandson wants to remember what the son wanted to forget is reinforced with almost every uh, interview I conducted with the, the sons and daughters of the very first immigrants. And I talked to all of those in Flint, Michigan, who, who are no longer with us, uh, unfortunately. So, uh, you know, some of those documents I'll share with you are the backbone of my book. There it is. Um, so, and I don't have time to talk about the press. And I'm so glad that Linda and Akram mentioned that. So the Arabic language press in New York, New Jersey, and across the United States, elsewhere, in, in the Midwest, also in uh, Highland Park, Michigan, and elsewhere, um, actually was a very important vehicle for delivering news from uh, the old country, disseminating the immigrants' news among their communities across the US, but also served a purpose to kind of preach the precepts of democracy to countrymen overseas on the pages of the Arab American press. Uh, and that deserves an attention all its own. Probably we need a lot of historiographies as you can, as you can tell. Why else would they publish entire articles by Rashid Rida or Muhammad Kurd Ali and other uh, scholars in the Middle East? Um, and Jurab al-Kurdi, you can add that to the mix uh, to Mirat al-Arab, Kaukab America and, and uh, uh, and the other newspapers. So let me spring forward to 19, the early 1920s. So one of the watershed events in the life of Arab Americans is this idea of Turkification. So they had secret societies, the Free Syria Society, I don't have time to share with you too much about that, was the first structured formal political organization. It was secret. One of its members was Mikhail Naimi, if you're familiar. He is our sort of, I don't know, Emerson in Arab literature, a huge figure. Uh, but so is Nasib Arida. Those two were members of the pen bond, Rabat al Qalamiya. Uh, but that event uh, was followed by the Belfort Declaration uh, on the heels of World War I, dividing the Levant among the colonialists, the British and the French, and promising Palestine as a national home for the Jews. That, like no other event, animated activism by a cross-section of Syrians. I emphasize cross-section of Syrians. Habib Ibrahim Katiba, Fuad Shatara, they all said, what will happen to Palestine now? Um, um, but of course, they were also worried about the fate of Syria, which was now under direct occupation by the French in the North and the British in the South who basically came up with the political borders, as you know, today with some modification. So what happened is that the Palestine National League, you can see it, I don't know if you can see my cursor, you can see the title of this organization was founded uh, in New York, and here's the address, by a doctor, physician uh, named Fuad Shatara. Um, and among the members, by the way, which is brand new information, there you have it, was the founder of the Arab Bank, Abdul Hamid Shaman, although he had he was in the States for a very short period of time, then he returned. So then Syria and Palestine kind of overlapped. The need there was great. And the immigrants, here it says in Arabic that they raised about $25,000, which they sent to the, uh, uh, their brethren overseas. This is a very considerable sum. In, 19, in the early 1920s. The, uh, the letter itself is uh, dated 1925, March 26th. And then all eyes really turned to Syria proper because of the great Syrian revolt. What happened is that the French were brutal. They were very vicious uh, in Syria. So people began to uh, collect aid to help their um, countrymen overseas. This is the Syrian Wounded Veterans Relief Committee is the rough English translation of that. And this became the nucleus for the first real, to use like an abstract term, formal 
structured large Arab American organization called the New Syria Party. So this aid effort, the same people involved in, in that in 1926, a year, roughly a year, a few months actually after the revolt um, happened. Sorry, should have done this. So um, they sent as much money as they can and they continued so until 1927, by that time, the revolution was stamped out by the uh, French who were uh, far superior to the, to the uh, Arab Syrian uh, fighters over there. And then that aid effort took on a new meaning as the new Syria party, when um, the collection of aid became systematic and comprehensive. And this is a letter, actually, I'm very lucky to have this one. This is signed, it took me a while to document the signature, although I could guess who it is. This is Sultan Pasha al-Atrash, who is the leader of the Syrian revolt in Syria proper. And this here is uh, Muhammad Amin al-Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, also a very progressive uh, fellow at the time and um, who opposed Zionism and British designs in Palestine. So folks could not send the money directly to the fighters in Syria. So they sent it to Hajj Amin Husseini in Jerusalem, who in turn funneled the money to the fighters uh, through the desert, you know, bordering, um, uh, conjoining basically Jordan proper and, and Syria. Um, and so you can see how there were no clear cut lines between your Syrian and a Palestinian. In fact, by that time, as uh, Rashid Khalidi tells us, cousin Pasha Husseini declared that southern Syria no longer exists. We have to defend Palestine. Their priorities are just beginning to change so that they can, they need to kind of direct all their efforts to uh, preserve or defend an area that is salvageable because the British and the French were there to stay in Syria and Iraq and Jordan and Palestine. And the fate of Palestine became um, a serious concern for the immigrants. So there's a, like a lag by a couple of years between the immigrants' activities and what's happening overseas. And this is one of the letters, um, reports about new Syria party's activities. Uh, and those, I mean, I bet you, you know, Jinan travels and talks to chapters and organizes all those activities across the country. They did more or less the same thing. They sent emissaries across the United States, Canada, and Mexico uh, to establish chapters who paid their dues. And they also had conventions. They held a couple of conventions. These pictures, I have the originals, as it were, of their second uh, national conference, basically, in, in Detroit, Michigan. Um, this caption is a reprint of what's on the photograph itself. So the guests of honors at the time <coughs> was Prince Shakib Arsalan, who was a direct emissary of uh, Sultan al-Atrash and who also represented Syria, not the geographic Syria, including Palestine and Lebanon in the League of Nations at the time, along with Nassim Saiba, this guy. So this guy is from Palestine and Shakib Arsalan is a known, very important Syrian intellectual and, and leader. Uh, and those folks were members uh, from different chapters across the US and Canada. As you can see, it's only men, it's mostly men. In this picture and the other picture, there is a lone woman sitting way in the back, uh, likely the wife of one of the dignitaries. But I was fortunate enough to talk to some of the descendants of uh, the organizers from the Hamadi family, Hamadi family in Flint and DC. And one of them confirmed that the women did all the work, uh, you know, behind the scenes. Uh, they did the cooking. They actually went to the train station in Detroit, as they often did, uh, also for the Arab National League. And they received the dignitaries. They're the ones who went and met the dignitaries, brought them back, where all the food was prepared. Uh, if it weren't for the women, uh, all you will have is formalities and, you know, a swanky event in a hotel room. But those guys had a clear agenda and they began to kind of hone in on their you know, lobbying through the new Syria uh, party activities. And then the, the Great Depression hit 
you know, the, the market crash, 1929, uh, people were grappling for a living all over the world. Uh, it was no different, you know, the lives of Arab Americans, you would think it, it went into a remission. Uh, nothing is further from the truth. Although you don't have an organization that is very active and visible at the time that I can discern a political one that is for our purposes, um, you have a wealth of information on the pages of Al Samir. So what we need are mentorable young people who are fluent in Arabic, who can translate an aggregate amount of these writings, who will tell us tales about Arab American life. They were interested in enslavement. They were interested in civil rights. They were interested in socialism, communism. Um, and Amir Rihani is one of the few who wrote about these things. Um, but on the pages of Al Samir, you can find poems about translations of um, uh, African-American early songs, black folks who were enslaved in the South, for example. Um, and you have a lot of poems about um, the before declaration uh, by none other than Ali Abu Mahdi and others. So they kept those memories alive and they told in details their interactions and comings and goings and experiences um, uh, in the course of Syria. So all that dissipated. Uh, so after a while, you have another revolt, this time in Palestine. Uh, the, the, in 1936, a general strike, and uh, you know people were pushed into a corner uh, until they could take no more. The development in Palestine was uneven. Uh, Jewish immigration uh, took its toll on the resources of the country. All, all the capital that um, came into Palestine was dedicated for electrification, uh, very often hiring Jews only, uh, Palestinian peasants were displaced. Um, so the reaction to that, the American or the, the United States com component of the Palestinian revolt was the Arab National League. The Arab National League, as a matter of fact, is resurrection of the Palestine National League you heard about earlier, be before the Syrian revolt. So the Arab National League, uh, in my mind, and I have very little doubt about this, is the largest organization in Arab American history to this day per capita. So one report put the numbers at 15,000 in the Detroit News. Let the number be 10,000, I mean, per capita. If you have, I don't know, 200 or 300,000 Syrians at the time, or Syrian, Lebanese, uh, Arab, Arabic speaking folks in the United States, uh, that's about 5% of the entire number, roughly speaking. Uh, you don't have that today. Uh, so the only organization that came close to this was the ADC in its heydays under totally different set of circumstances. But more importantly, the Arab National League uh, mirrors or sounds like every other important contemporary organization seeking namely to represent Arabic culture, heritage, history to American audiences, explaining um, the Arab point of view from conflicts, but also uh, what, what you have also developing is a sense of loyalty and belonging in the United States. Not to sound like an assimilationist, but a measure of integration is almost unavoidable. Those folks are raising their kids here, they're aging, very often their sons and daughters are actually carrying the torch. So what happened is that there were several conventions, four of them, and on the fourth convention of the Arab National League, which was held in Flint, Michigan, and here as you have the keynote speaker, Eliyahu Grant, who is a proponent of Palestinian rights, um, something very interesting happened. The reason why I said from the outset that this is not nothing unique, although it is very important, and as close as I could hope to come to a birthing moment for Arab American identity. So a young man stood in the convention in September, just when World War II started in Europe. That's on the same day the Germans stormed into Poland. And World War II was a matter of time. And he said, you know, we are proud Arabs. We are proud of our heritage, but we're also proud of, this, of being part, part of this country. So we talk a lot about pride, you know, and this and that, but this is the context for it here is very significant. Um, and one guest 
told them that, you know, I'm impressed with you in so many words that you are not near, merely Arabs in America, that you are Arab Americans. He came from Syria to collect money for hospitals and schools. And he knew the value of having a viable, organized, articulate, and prosperous Arab American community in the United States. And he had no problem with that. But then again, this was part of this cultural pluralist you know, paradigm which took over that convinced most Americans that you know those Southern Eastern Europeans, the Poles and the Italians and others, which we did not like, you know, after these bouts of pseudoscience called eugenics, that they are less inferior to the Northwestern Europeans, maybe they're okay. So you can hold on to your cultural traits and your background and yet be part of the United States as a citizen, cultural tourism, which replaced this Anglo conformity or the melting pot theory as they call it. Uh, and I hope after this, you'll always be use that melting pot business critically, uh, uh, not unquestioningly. So that's what happened. So they stood up and they said, we're Arab Americans, but they also had to, well, here is a picture. This is an article in the uh, Detroit News. And this is Emil Ghouri, a Palestinian again, um, and Jamil, uh, Mohammed Jamil Bayhom, which is a very important Lebanese intellectual. Uh, if you ask him, he would tell you I'm Syrian, even still at the time. Um, but those two were a repeat of you know, what you had before, uh, namely Nassim Seba and, and uh, Shakib Al Salan. And they were here on behalf of the Mufti of Jerusalem himself, Haj Amin Husseini, now living in exile. In fact, they had his fountain pen, Haj Amin Husseini's fountain pen, which was auctioned to send money overseas um, uh, to the victims of you know, uh, uh, British repression, which was uh, also uh, severe. Uh, 19,000 Palestinians were killed among them um, or wounded among them Azuddin al-Qassam, the leader of the revolt in 1936. Just to give you an idea about the contiguity of Syria, Azuddin al-Qassam, himself was from Syria, uh, by the way, uh, but he led the Palestinian revolt until the British put an end to that again. And this is actually a letter I gave the copyrights to that um, for a time, at least to University of Texas Press, that's why I'm being stingy here. This is a letter from Hajj Amin Husseini himself, so Amin Farah by name, signed by uh, Hajj Amin Husseini, um, thanking him for all his efforts on behalf of um, the revolt in Palestine. And the money that was sent back, by the way, by the new Syria party previously, and by the Arab National League is significant. By my count in today's money, it's like three and a half million dollars were raised and sent by the new Syria party. Although a good chunk of that came from very wealthy uh, Syrians in the Yucatan in Mexico. So to conclude, um, Arab American studies, as you can tell, is a work in progress. We have a lot of work to do. We have translations and what Akram is doing is invaluable. And um, I hope to work with him very soon to kind of um, uh, designate more uh, material for automation, although he may not know it yet, but we could see each other uh, in that context. Uh, I hope so. And also working with uh, Linda Jacobs, you know, by keeping the memory of the Arabat al qalamiya alive, or the pen bond, we also keep alive the, the, their content, their, the, the content of their letter, what they wrote about, how they felt, um, what they taught us, and how they described themselves as, Syri as Arab Syrians, um, as Arab Lebanese from, the, from Syria, uh, or Syrians from the Lebanon region, um, and what was on their minds. So we, we care about all that and we have a fraction of that as part of the discourse so far. I have wonderful stories I could share with you about the day-to-day -day life in Lower West Side of Manhattan, written by Abdul Masih Haddad or Gibran himself uh, or Ali Abu Mahdi uh, that kind of takes you behind the facade of shops and Argile and you know, uh, uh, those busy streets into the lives, the day-to-day -day lives, the minute-to-minute -minute life of uh, Syrian homes in Lower West Side of Manhattan at a minimum. So, and this is how you write Arab Americans into US history. They became American 
Arabs in the same way that Italians and Poles and others who came along with them in the same time, 120 years ago, as part of a massive migration of about 13 million people in the span of 10 years, although we were a fraction of that, um, uh, as a matter of fact, our impact on American public life has been disproportionate. And all we have to do now is, you know, um, wish Akram the very best in automating as much, you know, material as possible so more scholars can look at it and, and for Linda to come up with even more treasures from the past and excavate as many as possible um, of the Arabic language uh, archives and translate them in context and put them in the hand of younger generation who we hope will know what to do with them to complete for a more complete story of Arab American life. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hani. Uh, I can definitely tell that you're a professor because I felt like I was sitting in a college classroom. <laughs> Sorry about been that. A very long time since that. No, it was good. I was like really drawn in. Um, and so uh, that just is a testament